Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of My Angular Story. Now, this episode is one that I recorded for my Ruby story, but we talked quite a bit about Angular, and so I am going to uh, give you a chance to listen to it as well. So go ahead and enjoy. We had a great conversation about a lot of things that I think a lot of you are going to really uh, um, identify with. So here you go. Uh, yep. Hi, uh, so my name is Neil Brown. I work as a research fellow in programming education at King's College London. Awesome. I've always wanted to go to London. Okay. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, we had a really interesting conversation with you a couple of years ago. Uh, that was episode two, 257 of Ruby Rogues. We talked about learning and training. And, and really, it was kind of about at least a lot of what I remember is getting people into programming and then helping them level up. Yeah, yeah, that's so right. We're, right? We're, yeah. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Awesome. So let's go ahead and dive in and just talk for a minute about you and, and how you got into all of this stuff. To start out, I'd, I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about how you got into programming. Yeah, so uh, I don't know exactly what age I was, but I guess I was at uh, primary school, which should I translate as elementary school, right, in American terms. Um, so sometime during that, I just, I remember I went to my dad and I asked him, how are games made? Because at the time, you know, I was, <laughs> nice. so this must be sort of tail end of the 80s, I guess. I was playing games and I wanted to understand how they were made. And he sort of took down a, a book in the bookshelf that he happened to have on uh, an introduction to BASIC, which didn't really answer my question, or at least very indirectly. But I kind <laughs> of, I set about following the book and trying to, to learn BASIC. And I think it was several years before I had anything resembling a game, but I... I enjoyed the process, and, and so I think you know it didn't matter so much that I wasn't necessarily achieving what I wanted to achieve. Very cool. So usually this is the point where I ask how people got into Ruby, but we didn't really talk to you about Ruby, and I don't know if that's really your area of expertise. So have you done anything with Ruby? And then we'll dive into some of the other stuff that you have done that I know you've done. Yeah, so so I've, I've programmed in a lot of languages. Primarily, I program uh, Java at the moment, but we do actually have several websites that we run that are done in Ruby on Rails. So I do program bits of Ruby from time to time when we do maintenance and, and little bits, uh, but it's it's not my primary language at the moment. Gotcha. So one thing I am curious about, and, and this is something I should have asked earlier, but I didn't, is what, what kinds of things are you researching yeah, so one of the things we, we do is we try and make tools that help people um, sort of learn to program more easily. So we create IDEs for targeted at beginners that try and reduce a lot of the complexity that things like IntelliJ, Visual Studio, Eclipse uh, throw at people and just try and really pare it down so that when you're first learning to program, you're not overwhelmed by like, you know, all these sort of million options and what is a project and a workspace and a build system and all that sort of thing to just try and actually make it easy to write a bit of code and get some feedback on whether it's working or not and go again. That, that makes sense. How do you know, though, then if you've simplified the right things or made it work? Yes, <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, a lot of it sort of comes down to sort of aspects more of software design, I guess, as much as research of, you know, trying to think about sort of the user's point of view, the user experience, what do they need, what do they not need. There's complications that seem to arise because there's this notion of authenticity in programming education that a lot of people, when they come to learn, they want to use a tool that the professional's using because it makes them feel more like a professional. So right. they actually want to use Visual Studio, even though it's you know, quite complicated, because they know that's what the professionals use and they feel like they're becoming a professional. 
and, and certain aspects of education are trying to sort of educate people against their better judgment to sort of say, no, actually, you know, it would be better if you started with something simpler for the level that you're at and then level forward. But people are impatient, so they often want to rush forwards into professional tools, even if perhaps, you know, we might think it, it's not very advisable at that point. That makes sense. I'm, I'm curious, how did you get into this area of research? Complete coincidence. <laughs> so doing my uh, PhD in different area, uh, I was actually interested in concurrent functional programming. Um, and this job happened to sort of come up at the university I was working at um, just at the right time. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just do this for a little bit. Uh, and a little bit has turned into a long bit. And so I'm still doing it several years later. And I'm sort of really engaged with it. So what, how do you decide then what to look into and and then how do you test your hypotheses? Because, I mean, it's it's fascinating to think, okay, you know, there's there's some science behind how we write software, but it seems like most people try to just intuit their way to it. Yes. <laughs> I think there is an element of that. One of the, the projects that we've been doing recently is we have a large data collection project which collects activity traces of people who are programming with our software, which we can then record uh, and go back and analyze so that we can see what people are doing, what error messages they get, and what they do in response to those error messages. So that's a really sort of interesting project that, that we're involved with. That's interesting. So you have your own IDE. Is it specific to Java or is it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's right. So we have two IDEs. One's called BlueJ, one's called Greenfoot, and they're both for, for Java. And do people know that they're being essentially test subjects when they're using it? Oh, yeah. So so BlueJ, when you load it up, it, it comes up with an opt-in dialogue explaining the project that we're doing and asking whether they want to opt-in or not. So they have the, the choice at that point, and they can change their minds later on and, and opt out again. Oh, gotcha. So you can essentially turn the data collection piece on and off. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That makes sense. So what, what kinds of things do you see then? What, what kinds of things do programmers generally think is one way and turns out, hey, nope, not quite? Yeah, well, it's very interesting to go back and view the, the traces because we, we don't keep any other data about people. So right. the traces are kind of anonymous. You, you just see the code that they're, they're writing. You're not even sure what they're trying to do, although you can often from the sort of the code they've got and what they're doing, you can have a guess at what they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to get to. Uh, and the main impression I get is just that programming is a really frustrating experience for like <laughs> 90 plus percent of people. Like you, you watch them and, you know, I'm watching it like way after the facts. And as I say, it's anonymous. And I just want to reach back in time and tap them on the shoulder and say, no, no, the problem's there. <laughs> like, you know, you watch them do it and they're like, they get this error message, which you can see doesn't make much sense to them. And they're kind of editing in the right area. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, just, just fix that little bit there. And all of a sudden they're off down to the other end of the code and they modify this thing and they change it back and they do this and they do that. And you just see that, you know, for a lot of them, because we get the traces from not in like classrooms necessarily, but from mm -hmm. people who are just programming on their own at home. They've got no one to assist them. And yeah, it's, it's just clearly a very frustrating and confusing process for a lot of beginners. That makes sense. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So how long have you been doing this kind of research? Yeah, so that project's been going uh, for about five years now, I think, yeah, five years. And I've been doing this job for about sort of uh, eight or nine years, I think. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So let's say that I'm a software developer and I'm thinking, you know, I'd really like to conduct an experiment of my own. I mean, how would I get started doing something like that? Yeah, so I think the often the tricky bit is the in the design because the the design decides what analysis you'll do and therefore kind of what, what result you'll get out of it. And a lot of the concepts will be familiar to people, things like having a, a control group, um, right. you know, that uses existing software, for example, and a, a, what you might call a treatment group that uses like an augmented piece of software or a different piece of software. And then to try and take your participants, you often want to know their prior programming experience and ideally have a mix in kind of both groups so that you haven't accidentally put all the pros in one side because that's going to upset your your results yeah but theoretically i've been you know doing little experiments like that a b testing all sorts of sort of usability experiments that have become quite popular they're essentially you know scientific experiments in a sort of simpler sense or i was going to say in small scale but actually often the a b testing is a hell of a lot larger scale than what we right. often do with with people in person 
So it's the same kind of principle, and you just have to watch out for, you know, possible confounds in the data, confounds in the in the setup. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, what are some of the things that you've done that you're most proud of or excited about? Yeah, so this this data collection project has been quite interesting. One thing that we did with it uh, was a little sort of sub project where we looked at the errors that were most commonly made uh, in the source in the sort of data traces by beginners. And then we took a bunch of uh, programming educators, so people who teach uh, either at university or uh, secondary school level, uh, mm -hmm. uh, high school. Um, and we first asked the educators, what do you think are the most frequent mistakes that people make? And then we looked in the data to see what the most frequent mistakes people make are. Oh, interesting. And then we tried to compare the two to see, do people have an accurate idea of the most frequent mistakes? Uh, so the results for that turned out, uh, one thing that I hadn't quite expected, actually, is that the, the educators didn't form an agreement amongst each other. So we just asked a whole, you know, 70 mm -hmm. or so educators, and we pretty much got 70 completely different answers in terms of the rankings that they <laughs> oh, wow. they gave to the mistakes. So, uh, and, yeah, some, you know, that were a bit unexpected. They maybe said, oh, you know, students don't, well, yeah, so some said students don't make any syntax errors. Perhaps they're thinking of more advanced students. Some said students make primarily syntax errors and not sort of uh, type errors. So we're talking about Java here. So we've got, right. you know, this is uh, compile time errors where you might get a syntax error or you might get a, like a type error. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash a story. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. And so we got this complete mix from, from the educators and then we compared it to the real data and, you know, maybe one of them happened to be close, but it was more kind of like picking the lottery winners and winning the lottery rather than like sort of judgment, <laughs> I think, that, that really matched up. So, so that was a sort of interesting result that it seems, you know, for that particular setup that educators didn't have a, a sort of strong, coherent, accurate sense of which errors students were running into most often. Interesting. Very interesting. So how do you communicate that then to the people who are, you know, sort of out in the real world de dealing with these issues in a professional setting? Yeah. So, so I mean, you know, obviously we published the, the actual ranking that, that occurred there, but I guess the sort of overall lesson is, you know, be careful of your own expectate, you know, sort of expectation and judgments that it may not be completely accurate. More recently, we've I can I can give you some links at the end afterwards to stick up. But we've we also wrote a paper recently on sort of ten tips for teaching programming, where we try to take the sort of what has come out of research, not just our own research, but other people's research, to sort of say, okay, here here are the evidence backed tips for for how to teach um, programming. So there's there's a bunch of, sort of different things there, like live coding uh, seems to be effective, pair programming seems to be effective couple of other things to do with sort of instructional design oh interesting so what are you working on now yeah so so now we've been doing a bunch of just plain software work actually it's we're sort of we act half as researchers and half as developers because we're making these tools that people are kind of using to learn to program we also have to do all the software maintenance you know that you do when you've got a tool that has a, a bunch of users and you need to keep it up to date and and keep it ticking over uh, one of the tricky things in research i think is that that kind of work is often not recognized or sort of motivated you know mm -hmm. research is very focused on the new you know you've got to be learning something new making something new and there's right. perhaps less attention given to maintenance it's kind of you know you see this in software sometimes don't you that legacy software and maintaining software is somehow seen as less worthy than creating new software and i think research even dials that up a bit so we've been doing you know essential work but 
work that kind of doesn't lead to kind of much recognition or papers or anything like that. So a whole bunch of sort of refactoring and readjusting the software with some of the recent changes we've made. That's just, that just sounds fascinating. Well, I don't, I don't know what else we should dive into here. I'd, I'd love to get you back on Ruby Rogues or JavaScript Jabber or something and just talk about a little bit more of, you know, some of these things that, that people run into and what you're finding with your research. But yeah, uh, yeah if, if people decide that this is a career track that they're interested in, do you have any advice for them? Yeah, so I think obviously one common step to get into research is, is to look at studying for a PhD, um, which mm-hmm. helps to kind of give you the sort of some of the skills, the knowledge and, and the background in an area that you might be be interested in. So that would be the sort of academic route into these things. One of the tricky things with doing education is that, you know, it's often hard to sort of make money directly from these kinds of activities, which is why you don't see a whole lot of sort of private providers creating the sort of the kinds of tools that that we make because often they usually end up giving them away for free anyway so you have Mm -hmm. to you know it's a more indirect revenue model than just we'll make something useful for people and charge them directly for it yeah so go pursue a phd Are, are there a lot of universities that do this kind of research it doesn't seem like there are i've talked to maybe a handful of people that really do this kind of research on how software developers work yeah, so there's sort of there's a couple of kind of similar fields. There's sort of had the study of professional software engineers, and there's a bunch of conferences and researchers who are into that. Our sort of area is more how sort of people in schools and universities learn to program, and that's perhaps a smaller, more niche area of research. And again, just like it's hard to sort of earn direct revenue from it, it's kind of hard to find research funding for it too, because not a whole bunch of providers are kind of interested in that intersection. It tends to fall between the people who fund computing and the people who fund education with both of them looking at the other one saying that it's their Mm -hmm. responsibility. So I think the NSF in the US uh, does some funding um, for these kind of things. Awesome. All right. Well, the last section of our show is picks. Do you have some things you want to shout out about? Yeah, I came up with uh, two picks. Um, So one writer that I'm quite keen on is a guy called Michael Lewis, who writes a lot of uh, nonfiction. Probably the most well-known ones are Moneyball and Big Shorts, because they both got made into to films. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've just started his latest book, but I can't recommend that because I've only just begun. So instead, uh, there's a book called Flash Boys that he wrote about two or three years ago, which is all about uh, sort of stock markets and high-frequency trading. Um, and essentially, it's about the effect that computing and sort of hidden algorithms have on, uh, in this case, the stock market. It's something that's come up uh, quite a bit recently in a couple of years, you know, these opaque algorithms that large companies have, where if you can't tell what it's doing, you can kind of get a bit screwed over by how it's operating. Uh, And Flash Boys kind of digs into that a bit in the sort of area of the stock markets and whether you can trust the broker that you're using to buy shares to kind of be acting fairly and in your interest. So I found that, that quite interesting from a computing perspective. Very nice. Yeah, and those those are both books that I've been looking into, wanting to read, but I only have so much time. Yes, yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> it's difficult to find the time. Yeah. So I do most of my reading on Audible. Right, yeah. In other words, so I listen to the books instead of read them. And I, I really enjoy it. Occasionally, I will, I will pick up a book and uh, I'll listen listen to it and then I'll have to actually go buy it because <laughs> <laughs> right so I'll either get it on the Kindle app and highlight stuff or I'll actually buy the physical book and draw in it which you know bugs some people but that's kind of my method yeah when I actually have a physical book so anyway interesting stuff there a few things that I'm going to shout out about one of them is and this is something that I've done recently by the time this comes out you know it's going to be old news Unless you listen to the other shows and you're going to be like, where the heck was he for a month? But I, I've taken a month off of the regular recordings. So that's Ruby Rogues, JavaScript, Jabber, Adventures in Angular, React Roundup, Views on View, Elixir Mix, you know, all the different shows that we, we do on devchat.tv. Um, my co-hosts are all keeping those going, but I've just been trying to figure things out with the business of running the podcasts and some personal stuff, you know, relating to some, some of the stuff that I've been through. If you listen to the other shows, you, you know what's going on because I'm pretty transparent about that, but I don't want to tell a long story here. But anyway, so I'm just taking some time, uh, getting some downtime, and I just want to kind of let people know and, and sort of give verbal permission, I guess, if, if you need somebody to tell you it's okay to take some time. So if you're overwhelmed, if you're burned out, if you're exhausted, uh, depressed, 
take some time, take some time off and, and really just kind of figure some things out. And that's been really, really, really positive for me. One other thing that I've been doing is just working on a software project. So yesterday I wasn't super motivated. And then I got into working on the software project that I'm working on that helps to manage the podcasts and the sponsorships and stuff. And that also just, you know, it nobody's breathing down my neck for it. It's going to make things better around here, but mostly it's just something for me to bang on. I mean, it is in production. It is something that I use every day. But uh, anyway, just working through that and, and having kind of a side project has really been helpful as well. So I'm going to pick those two things. And then as far as reading books goes, the book I'm reading right now is, it's actually the book that comes before a book that I've picked in the past. That book was uh, Crucial Accountability. And this one is Crucial Conversations. And it talks about having the risky conversations about things that are somewhat uh, emotionally charged, either for you, for someone else, or you know, whatever, you know, high stakes conversations kinds of things. And sometimes the high stakes conversations are not about anything that really impacts you, but it's something that you are emotionally invested in. And sometimes it really is something that impacts your day to day. So they just talk through, okay, these are the kinds of conversations that fall under this category. Here are different ways of approaching it uh, so that you can have a constructive outcome. And I find that in a lot of cases, when we're talking about tooling, which is kind of what uh, Neil and I were talking about here, um, and you know how the tools and practices affect what you're doing, um, I find that if you're able to have these kinds of crucial conversations on your teams with your boss, you know, if you're the boss with the people who work for you, and you know you're able to have them in a constructive way, then a lot of times what winds up happening is you're able to move forward in a better way because you can clear stuff out of the way, you can be respectful of each other, you can do all of these things that kind of set you up for the the right kind of uh, path moving forward. And so I, I really think that a lot of times we get focused on the techniques and the tools and the technology and we forget about talking. So uh, I'm just going to throw that out there too. All right, Neil, if people want to find you online, see what you're working on, you know, read your brilliant papers that you're publishing, where do they go find all that stuff? Yeah, so you, you can find a lot of the stuff uh, by searching for me, especially with my initials, so Neil C.C. Brown, and that's my Twitter handle, in fact. So uh, N-E-I-L C.C. Brown will find me on Twitter, and then you can probably find a lot of links from there. Okay. Do you blog anywhere or anything like that? Uh, I did, but uh, I, it's so hard to sort of keep all these things in the air, so I must have, I haven't blogged for the past year or so. It's tricky. Okay. Well, then, uh, folks, go check him out on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, uh, you can also check out Blue Jay and Greenfoot. Now it's Blue Jay like the letter J, not Blue J-A-Y, right? Yep, that's right. Okay. Yeah, if you just Google for those again, you'll, you'll find them. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for coming, Neil. That's okay. Well, thank you for talking to me. All right. We will wrap this one up, and we will catch you all next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.